Thanks to modern technology, we now have access to sermons from pastors from all around the world. So how do we know if a specific teacher is someone we can trust? Alistair Begg answers that question today on Truth For Life Weekend with a message titled, False Teachers Among You. He's drawing these principles from the book of 2 Peter, and we're in chapter 2. The flow from chapter 1 to chapter 2 is almost broken by the chapter distinctions here. And you really need to recognize that he has been speaking very much about those who have spoken from God at the end of chapter 1. These people who did not have their prophetic words in the uh, origin of their minds, but rather they spoke from God. And then he says, of course, there were also another group of people, and they were not speaking from God. We have reason to be thankful, he said, for the prophets whom God established and by whom he spoke his divine word. But there were also, verse 1 of chapter 2, false prophets, and there will be false teachers among you. And so you need to be alert. Now, the word which will perhaps stand out to you and should is the word among. There were also false prophets among the people, and there will be false teachers, notice, among you. It is one thing to fight a battle with those who are beyond the walls. It is quite another to be engaged in dealing with a fifth column that has crept into the city under cover of darkness. And these words ought to make us think of the words of Paul when he leaves the Ephesians, with whom he had spent some years, and as he bids farewell to them in that lovely scene on the beach that is recorded for us by Luke in Acts chapter 20, he says to them, "'Savage wolves will come in among you, and even from your own number men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them, so be on your guard.'" Now, it should be fairly obvious, but it bears saying that such individuals do not arrive wearing a sign on their hats, which reads, heretics. And their stories will probably not be mentioned when they are interviewed for membership of the local church. Indeed, the thing that will perhaps appeal most to those who are conducting the interviews is the fact that these individuals are very obviously Uh, men with leadership qualities. They clearly are articulate. They understand a great deal about the Bible. It's apparent just in interviewing them. And as they walk away from the interview, uh, we may be tempted to say, now there is somebody who has a future in this church in terms of the potential for leadership. In Galatians, Paul speaks of false brothers who infiltrated our ranks to make us slaves. So what you have here in this opening little section of the chapter is not something that is unique to Peter. Uh, Paul mentions it on these occasions. You also find that the apostle uh, John speaks of those who went out from us because they were not of us. But for a while, as they participated in the events that were going on, it was apparent, at least to those who lacked discernment, that these individuals were just one of the group. Now, when we think on verses like this, there are two great dangers to avoid. There, the dangers that we suggest to one another need to be avoided when we think about the devil. Danger number one, we become completely preoccupied with the devil, and we think he's everywhere, around every corner, and we see him all the time. Or the opposite danger, and that is to ignore him completely and to live as if he did not exist at all. In the same way, when you think in terms of false prophets, destructive teachers creeping in, We have to beware of naively assuming that all is well, or conversely, constantly ferreting around looking for falsity. And usually in the balance of a leadership structure, uh, it will be possible for those who are constantly looking for falsity to be balanced out by those who are a little more naive, and somehow or another in His providence, God keeps it all together. But we do need to be careful. Now, Peter helps us by giving to us the strategy of these individuals so that we're not left just wondering exactly how they may be detected. He wants his readers in the context of the first century to recognize that there were certain characteristics that marked their approach. First of all, they work undercover. They will secretly introduce things. 
So it's an undercover uh, operation. At the same time, uh, the material that they suggest, the stories that they tell, uh, whatever they appear on the outside, are actually destructive. So that they tear down, they disintegrate, they divide, they destroy, they harm. Also, these individuals are shameful. The activities that, if you get to know them, and the kind of things they're suggesting, the, the opportunities that they present to men and women are actually shameful. And the word that is used there for shameful is the same word that is used in verse 7 and is translated filthy, and is the same word that is used in verse 18 and is translated lustful. So you have already a picture in your mind, individuals working undercover uh, with the notion of destruction and with activities that are shameful. At the same time, they are the kind of individuals who take advantage of people. That's the point in verse 3. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you. They will seek to take advantage of you. And they're able to do so because they are very inventive, hence the phrase, with the stories they have made up. These individuals are simply full of hot air. And you need to be aware of that. So he is encouraging his readership to make sure that they are alert, that they are wise, and that they are sensitive to these things. If that marks their strategy, then what is true of their impact? Well, actually, quite surprisingly, their impact is significant. Verse 2, notice the first word. It's not that these individuals will have a marginal impact when they begin to exploit the people around them, but many will follow their shameful ways. And as a result of this, the way of truth will be brought into disrepute. So people in the world will say, when they see these events and they see these activities, how can these people possibly claim to be the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ? We do not believe the Bible. We don't really have much to say about Jesus, but we know enough to know that the shameful nonsense that is going on there is something that does not concur with the Sermon on the Mount. We know enough to know that. And don't you find that where on the fringes of uh, orthodoxy there are all kinds of dramatic claims all kinds of scurrilous notions, we're on the receiving end of our friends' questions. What is possibly happening there, they say? And their impact upon a growing crowd is directly related to their strategy. Says Mayer, there are a number of characteristics that uh, define just why they are so successful. First of all, they're flatterers in the way they teach. Secondly, they have financial ambitions which they more than often suggest to their readers they can also enjoy. There is a greedy, exploitive dimension to what they're doing. Their lives are dissolute. Their consciences are cauterized. Their aims are deceptive. And you say, well, why would anybody follow this? And the fact is, that people are quite willing to sign up for a religious experience where belief is confused and where behavior is compromised. It's far harder to draw a crowd where belief is defined and behavior is demanded. If you want to draw a big crowd, offer to them a religious experience where belief is confused or at least diverse or is self-actualized, and where behavior is not impinged upon by belief. Their strategy is clear, their impact is obvious, and their destiny is equally clear. Look at the words at the end of verse 3. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. They may poo-poo the idea of final retribution, but they are doomed men, and they live on the edge of destruction. And God, who doesn't slumber nor sleep, according to Psalm 121, has not been naive to what has been going on. And the swift destruction of the end of verse 1, notice, bringing swift destruction on themselves is exactly what will happen. They are responsible for bringing on themselves their destruction. They are guilty of denying the sovereign Lord, the sovereign Lord who bought them. 
Wayne Grudem suggests that the best way to understand this is in terms of the people of old in Deuteronomy 32, when God had redeemed his people uh, from uh, the bondage of Egypt, that it could be said of them that they were rightly owned by God, that they were rightly bought by God. But what is also very clear is that those who were bought in that sense, who were brought out of the land of Egypt, many of them were ungrateful to God. Many of them did not love God in their hearts. And therefore, says Grudem, clearly Christ's specific work of redemption cannot be in view in this verse. That whatever else it means, it is not taking the work of the atonement and turning it upside down. So therefore, we need to ponder it further. But we have no time to ponder further this evening. These individuals were showing that despite all of their ability with words, their denial of the Lord Jesus Christ was making it clear that they were not part of his body. And there's absolutely no, con- no doubt about the condemnation that hangs over them and the dreadful destruction that awaits them. And then he says, of course, you shouldn't be surprised by this. And he takes them back through a little uh, journey in the Old Testament with three examples of God's unerring judgment. And again, each of these we could delay on for a long time, but I, for your encouragement, I want you to know that I'm not going to. I simply want to point them out to you again. And his construction is clear. He says, for if this, if this, and if this, then therefore this. And that's exactly what he's doing. And he starts with the fall of angels. What if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell and put them in gloomy dungeons? Certainly a tremendous amount of uh, ink has been spilled trying to determine exactly the circumstances to which Peter is referring. It's most often explained, I discovered, in terms of an equally obscure passage in Genesis 6. So you start with an obscure passage in the New Testament, go find an obscure passage in the Old Testament, put the two together, and try and bring clarity out of it. It's a fairly daunting task. In the Genesis 6 passage, the sons of men is taken to refer to angels. The trouble is, when you read Genesis 6, and you read the commentary, and the commentary says, this means angels, any sensible person says, why? And the more you read, the more you realize that they can't tell you exactly why, but they just think it's a jolly good guess. So if we can't be certain that Genesis 6 applies to angels at all, then Genesis 6 is going to be a difficult passage to use as the key to unlock 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Therefore, what do we do? Be cautious. The main things are the plain things. The plain things are the main things, and two factors are clear. So take what is clear and move on. And what is obscure, come back to when you have a lot of time, which most of us don't have. What is clear? What is the point he's making? Number one, even angels are not exempt from judgment. Right? We can say that categorically. And as with Satan in Revelation 20... These angels are bound now, and they are destined for final judgment. Now, it seems to me that that's enough. I really don't need to know any more than that unless I'm doing a PhD. If the angels experience this, and angels experience judgment, and if they are bound over for eternal condemnation and destruction, as is the evil one as described in Revelation 20, then you ought to be on your guard. And then he proceeds to the next illustration. And if he didn't spare the ancient world, he moved from the angels to the flood. In Hebrews chapter 11, we read of Noah, by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. You picture Noah at work on his structure there in his backyard being ridiculed by his neighbors. What do you mean that God will judge the world, Noah? Who do you think you are standing up saying these things? And by the way, is his judgment inevitable? Oh, yes, said Noah, his judgment is inevitable, but it is not inescapable. And so Peter's inevitable message of judgment on a sinful world is not one of unrelieved gloom. It's not a word of dreadful pessimism, for he offers the way of escape through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Noah was a man who preached righteousness, and he established the way of faith. There is nothing that I know that induces scorn and contempt from my unbelieving friends 
more than the notion of God's righteous judgment. And yet they take their bar exam and they either pass or fail. They take their actuarial exams and they either qualify or they don't. They take their S and so it goes on. But somehow or another, when it comes to the matter of the unerring wisdom and judgment of God, And then the third and final for this evening uh, illustration that he uses is from the cities of the plain. And if he condemned, verse 6, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes. And again, Peter is alluding to the destruction that took place there as a forcible reminder to the reader in his generation, and indeed to every generation, that unrighteousness will end in ruin. We might note in passing and be challenged by the fact that Lot was a righteous man living in the middle of filthy, lawless men. And you will notice verse 8, he says just parenthetically, for that righteous man living among them, that is in this filth, living among them day after day, was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. It makes me think of Paul in Athens. Remember, it says that he was distressed to the point of paroxysms when he realized how tremendously religious these people were, and yet they did not understand the truth. And so his soul is stirred within him. Such a challenge to me. Most of the cities I go and visit, I'm taking photographs of them. I'm looking at the architecture. I'm not thinking about the souls of men and women. I should be. And is it possible for me to be surrounded by filth and lawlessness and become so inured to it over time that I don't have any response as Lot had in his day? We're not isolating things for the sake of it, but Sodom and Gomorrah was representative of a dreadful form of chaos, if you recall the description there. And as a godly man, he was sorely distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men. Is it wrong for us to be distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men? Are we to assume that the gay rights movement and the lesbian lobby will just continue to march unchallenged through our land? And men and women who love righteousness and truth, silenced for fear of being regarded as homophobic or judgmental, all that it takes for all of this evil to triumph is for the righteous to feel nothing, to say nothing, to do nothing. And I hope you will notice that in relationship to the punishment, there is an immediate effect and an ultimate judgment. Do you see that? These people are experiencing judgment now, and they will experience judgment then. That's the significance of the phrase in verse 9, while continuing their punishment. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment. Notice, while continuing their punishment— Just as the believer receives a foretaste of heaven, so for the willful impenitent there is an indication of hell. And look at verse 10. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature and despise authority. Now, the danger in studying in this way is that we get so close to it that we miss the perspective altogether. Let me say a word or two in summary, and I'm through. If you stand back from this passage and say, now, what is the broad sweep of the message being conveyed? I think you'll agree with me that it is this. Number one, the reality and inevitability of judgment. Number two, the unequivocal pronouncement on unrighteousness. There's no shilly-shallying with the issue, well, of course, this is just their way of going about it, or this is a preference or whatever. No, it's said in the very starkest and clearest of terms. And also, and this will become more apparent as we read on, in the midst of all of that, Peter is reminding his readers of the keeping power of God as we look forward to a new heaven and to a new earth, which is going to be the home of righteousness itself. You have to wait to the 13th verse of chapter 3 to get there, but that's what he's saying to them. In keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. And so let me remind you tonight, as we go into another week where folly has bred madness and wickedness, 
where shamefulness is all around, where it seems as though the score is the devil 10, Jesus 1. The secular culture advancing, prevailing, the church dwindling, confused, fighting itself, closing its doors, running in retreat. And here we sit, about to do as Jesus said. Some of us tempted to repeat the words of the disciples in the boat, Lord, don't you care that we are drowning here? And Luther's words stand and tower and prevail. And though this world with devil's oar should threaten to undo us, we shall not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. One little word shall fell him. Or in the more triumphant hymnody in choruses of the 60s or the 50s, probably, God is still on the throne, and he will remember his own. Though trials distress us and burdens oppress us, he never will leave us alone. For God is still on the throne, and he will remember his own, and his promise is true. He will not forget you, for God is still on the throne. Lift your eyes and look up. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, we pray now that you will grant to us such a sense of your presence that our feet may not stumble, our faith may not falter, and our fellowship may not be marred by the inroads of error and evil. Grant to us, Lord, that happy and necessary balance. Grant to us discernment, gentleness, wisdom, and grace. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God is still on the throne. That's the encouragement today from Alistair Begg on Truth For Life Weekend. As Alistair spoke today about the marks of a false teacher, it reminds me of one of the main passions we have here at Truth For Life. We are committed to teaching God's Word, and one of our goals is to help strengthen local churches all around the world. We pray that as you listen and learn from this program, you'll be better equipped to support your local pastor and to identify when false teachers might be creeping into your congregation. With that end in mind, we select biblical resources to help you continue learning and growing throughout the week. Right now, we're featuring a collection of sermons from a 19th century pastor, a man named Robert Murray McShane. The collection is titled, The Believer's Joy. Now, McShane passed away at the young age of 29, but he has left a lasting legacy of faithful, gospel-centered preaching. And that teaching is passed down to us today through his writing. This inspiring collection of sermons is a perfect introduction to his work. It offers a refreshing perspective on the joy that we find in Jesus. Learn how to request your copy of The Believer's Joy when you visit us online at truthforlife.org. And if you're a pastor or an elder, we want to remind you that the annual Basics Conference is coming up soon at Parkside Church. This year, the event takes place May 6th through the 8th, and it features the teaching of Alistair Begg, Andy Gemmel, and Rico Tice. The conference is part of our commitment to supporting local churches. We'd love to have you join us this year. Registration is open, so be sure to visit basicsconference.org. I'm Bob Lapine, hoping you'll join us again next weekend when Alistair delivers a cautionary message about the danger of drifting spiritually. This program and the Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.